presentation, which have been uploaded on our website as well as the Stock Exchange website. The transcript of this call will be available in a week's time on the company's website. Please note that today's discussion may be forward-looking in nature and must be reviewed in relation to risk pertaining to our business. After the end of this call, in case you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to the investor relation team. I now hand over the call to Arun to make the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, and appreciate everybody's time today. It's been an important day for Solara as we kind of reversed uh, certain corporate actions that we took uh, almost 18 months ago. Um, so at, at that time when the deal was announced, I was on this call and today, consequently, uh, with, with the deal being called off, I thought it was appropriate for me to address the initial part of the conversation to explain the, lo the rationale behind it. So just, just in terms of full disclosure, you know, as promoters, we, we also own uh, a role, uh, which was a private API company that was being built uh, to, to scale. Um, and when we announced this transaction, both Aurora and uh, Solara were delivering the highest business performance, riding the highs of the API industry, general shortages of APIs and the demand around it. Regretfully, the, the deal has taken a lot of time to, to close, uh, and obviously deal fatigue emerged in, in terms of a transaction which takes so much time to close. So while we had we had spent a lot of time on the strategy and also the integration, uh, in terms of the process, we appointed a, a first-class international banker. We had a third-party valuation that was done, and also uh, we had uh, filed our documents with the SEBI uh, however, there were some issues with the minority shareholder in one of the subsidiaries of a role, uh, which resulted in a change of the scheme, took a lot more time, and consequently, we, we, we finally received all the necessary approvals from the NCLT uh, to submit to the NCLT just a couple of months ago. Uh, in the interim period, obviously, Solara's businesses were severely impacted uh, with the headwinds that we faced uh, with the lack of ibuprofen sales and the challenges around that business and some of the course corrections that we took uh, several quarters ago. This resulted in, um, in a significant drop in Solara's margins, but the same impacts of another type also was impacting the financial performance of our own. And while uh, Solara's performance was, is, is has been depressed. Uh, we still do have an EBITDA that that is that where we can grow from here. Uh, unfortunately, with an over dependence on COVID products, in the case of Aror, and with the uh, in the recent six months, we have seen a lack of demand for the, the primary tactical products that Aror was was selling, um, dropping significantly. Where the economics does not make any more sense for the Solara shareholders uh, to keep the ratios intact and it would not be appropriate for for us to then recommend to the board that the as promoters that the merger should go through. So this is the reason why the, the merger was called off. We, we've had significant progress with a strategic intent. Uh, there's a lot of value in what the two companies were creating uh, and we believe that there are ways and means in an, on an arm's length basis that we can benefit from those opportunities. We'll continue to focus on that. Uh, but at this time, uh, the most important uh, challenge for the company was to, for Solara was to rebuild its business, rebuild its confidence with all its stakeholders and customers and its employees especially. Uh, and for that reason today, uh, we decided that it was best that we focus on an organic strategy for Solara, keep aside all the inorganic actions and move forward. But most, most importantly, I'm extremely delighted uh, to have Jitesh back to run the company as a CEO. Uh, this is an important step for strides uh, for Savara Apologies. As uh, Jitesh was in, Jitesh and Hari, who we announced uh, as a CFO in the last earnings call, uh, to come back 
to Solara to rebuild the company with the deep insights of the of the business itself, for the fact that they were involved in the company uh, since inception. I'm extremely confident about uh, about this team uh, and the leadership capabilities of both Jitesh and Hari to bring this business back back on track. Uh, and um, and the board is very supportive of this decision. Uh, so I just I, I will say stay through the call to answer any specific questions on a promoter rational. Uh, but having said uh, said that, and since I have a non-executive role, um, I'll continue to stay invested and committed to the to the, the journey of Solara. I strongly believe that it has got all the right elements to to build build out into a into a high-performing company, and we will see that emerging in the near in the near future. Uh, with that, uh, I, I also apologize to to several of you who may have been confused with the recent changes that we have been we made. Uh, but I think all of this, including today's corporate action decision, behind us, the company can focus on on the course correction journey and build out the business for the future. Uh, with this, I will let uh, Titesh and Hari to 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 commence their opening remarks and then. I'll stay behind if there are any specific questions addressed to me. Thank you. Thank you, Jitesh. Thank you, Arun. Good evening, everyone. It is good to be speaking to all of you in this forum after a while. I hope all of you are fine and in the best of health. Both Hari and I are pleased to be back to reset and steer Solara back to growth and profitability. We thank the founders and the board for reposing their trust and confidence in us. We also like to thank our investors for their conference reports in us during our first tenure at Solara. Since Solara's inception, we have been driving Solara and our focus will be to review and grow the business, business on its key pillars consisting of IBU and non-IBU APIs, our cost, our continuous improvement programs including backward integration for our key APIs, new product introductions, and CRAMs. These four pillars have strengthened our position as a pure play API company. We are optimistic about the future potential of Solara mainly with capturing the opportunities in the core business where we see green shoots in the demand and converting inquiries into new business, file at least six new products in FI23, aggressive continuous improvement programs, and lastly, improving our success rates to secure new cramps business. We have short-term challenges on two of our key products, with price to revert to normalcy and increase in RM price due to current international situation, and we expect the same to normalize in the second half of this financial year. While this has impacted our gross margins, actions are in place to minimize the impact. Coming to our uh, Kadlur API facility, our regulatory track record with various ag agencies has been exemplary. Barring the OAI classification of our Kadlur API facility due to ranitidine NDMA issues, we firmly believe that with US FDA inspections initiated, we are hoping for reclassification of our OAI status based on all the data points provided to US FDA. Our evidence of work done on ranitidine resulted in the restoration of our CEP back in July 2021. As of now, there are 10 new approvals pending reclassification of our Kadlur OAI status. With the belief that the reclassification of our OAI status within the first half of this financial year, we have considered new sales in the second half. Coming to the under recovery of our Vizac facility, let me recall our justification for our investment. There were three main reasons for investment. One, the expansion of capacity of our key products new product filings, and backward integration of key intermediates. While the investments have been made, we expect to trigger the regulatory inspection in this financial year. Clearly, as we focus on the regulatory markets, the gestation period for sales is at least 24 months from when we complete validation batches. However, we are tapping opportunities in markets with no regulatory binding. With new products being introduced in this financial year and some being filed in WISAC, we are confident of minimizing our impact of under recoveries in WISAC in this financial year. The rigor in continuous improvement programs have been reintroduced and we expect to contribute, in, uh, contribute improvement in gross margins from second half of this financial year. With the focus on the, all of these actions above, we are confident about the future prospects of 
Solara. I now hand over to Hari to take us through the financials for the last quarter, the Q4 FI22, and the year as a whole. Thank you again. Thank you, Arun and Jitesh. I thank the founders and the board for the opportunity given. We have pleased to announce that quarter four financials along with the FI22 consolidated results. The key highlights are as follows. Our EBITDA, our revenue for this Q4 at 367, which is 90% of our historical rent rate, and adjusted EBITDA at rupees 50 crores at 13.6% uh, EBITDA rate. Our revenue for FI22 stood at 1,289 crores compared to the 1,645 crores of the previous year. Our gross margin for the quarter four at 44.1% and year as a whole at 47.6% as against compared to the 54.7% in FI21. We close out at FI22 consolidated EBITDA at 992 crores compared to the 400 crores in FI21. We recognize the fact that we have to work to do to improve our gross margin and EBITDA which is due to the under recovery from Vizac facility and in, and in, the, or in the delay in the new product introduction. As it is pointed out, we have identified key focus areas which will result in the improvement expected from second half of current financial year, that is FI23. We are conscious of the fact that our red book has increased over 50% as the funds deployed into the Vizac. Our immediate priority is to get the Vizac off the roads to make the achieve the break even and profitable growth in the near term, including the including getting the facility triggered for inspection, which was delayed due to COVID. Our primary focus is to achieve comfortable debt EBITDA, net debt to EBITDA, well rate, and improve our cash flow to, by prudent application of capital. We are pleased to inform you that our credit rate has been retained at A minus for long term and working capital. With the clear focus for the on the actions to improve profitability, we remain confident about growth prospects of Solara. Thank you. Sanford, we can take the Q&A, please. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may please press star, then one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star, then two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who wishes to ask questions, please press star, then one. The first question is from Manish Gupta from Solidarity. Please go ahead. Uh, can you walk us through your slide 27, uh, where you've uh, you know cut the PNL into core business, R&D led growth business, and the Vizac led business? So in that you show, uh, if I take Q4, your revenue of R&D led growth business is zero and Vizag led growth business is zero. And the same thing is also true for the full year. And you have an EBITDA there of minus 54 for the R&D led growth business and minus 58 crores for Vizag led business. So when you have EBITDA of minus 54 and minus 58, what does that mean? Uh, are you saying that these, this is the cost that you have apportioned to these businesses which is earning you no revenue right now? Yes, are you here? Slide 27. Correct. See, just to clarify that, you know, we have bifurcated our current financials in quarter four as well as in year as a whole into three buckets. One is a core business, where is our main products are being uh, undertaken. And R and D, and you know where the cost incurred. You rightly said that we have incurred a cost, you know, uh, for this uh, for the R and D facilities and R and D activities. And next is that uh, the Vizac, where there is under recovery of, you know, due to the delay in the regulatory approval, and you know uh, the regulator market sales cannot be taken place, and you know we are not got the regulatory approval due to COVID delays. Uh, the delays are taken place for the inspection. So that's the reason that you know they, we have to incur the cost. But the depreciation and the interest cost for the project has to be gone through the PNL. That's the impact that we are having in the up to the uh, P80 level. And if you look at our uh, core business, where we have made a current year on 367 crores and 40 crores of EBITDA, and here as a whole on 1,288 crores and 200 crores of EBITDA. So we are impacted by the uh, delay in the new product introduction and the growth business and the buyback led business, which is uh, cost-based business, and we are not going to pay any revenue for that. 
as per inter Indian in 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 accounting standards, we have to charge of the revenue expenditure incurred on the WISAC, even though that you know uh, we have started the operation but could not get the regulatory approval. So that's the reason we in a transfer planner we are showing our P and no, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. If if we just take the Vizac led business as an example, yes. minus 50, so you're saying there is 58 crore of fixed cost in Vizac, yes, which is yes. earning no revenue because uh, this is EBITDA, right? So this does not include depreciation and interest. Correct. So there is a 58 crore fixed cost in Vizac, which is earning no revenue. Correct. Last year. Correct. And uh, this is 53 crores of R&D led growth business. Correct. And uh, therefore, one would have had, can you give us the same figures uh, like you cut for fiscal year 22 for fiscal year 21 in these three buckets? Uh, we will do. do? Uh, we are, we are, I, at present, I don't have, but then we can give, uh, we'll ask our, uh, we'll provide you, sir. So, Manish, uh, this is Arun, and for the benefit of the new management team, um, I can just try and put a little more color around your question. Um, typically, in the pharmaceutical, in the API business, uh, when you have an R&D pipeline, you also seed new customers uh, for new products. That revenue and margins that we normally make typically sets off the R&D spend. What that deck also says that our R&D flow through of new products and customer acquisition of new programs was not a great year for us in the last financial year. So that if that is for the first time it's happened. So typically, you when you do six or seven new products, you seed customers in the formulation space, and to a very large extent, your R&D is squared off. Uh, this is the first time in the history of Solara that in the last 12 months, we were not successful on that front. So that is why the revenue from uh, that that activity has is shown as zero, while the costs have been incurred. Yeah, sorry to uh, you know just uh, uh, push on this, but it's important for us to understand this. So, you know, when you say R and D led growth business, uh, so last year you would have had some revenue. So, when you say R and D led growth business, this would be perhaps new products, yes. right? That you have new products, right? So, so, uh, so, so this is so. The way to look at this is that there was no revenue from new products in fiscal year 22. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Got it. So this and uh, in similarly we say when you say Vizac led business, this is your Vizac plant. So revenue from the Vizac plant was zero. Correct. The Vizac plant is an SE, right? Uh, and it has to be qualified by customers and by regulators. Uh, none of that happened last year simply because no regulatory inspections were happening. It is now commenced. We expect the site to be inspected during this fiscal year. Uh, we, we can also tell you that part of the investment on that plant was prepaid by a customer for volumes. So it is just a function of inspection and qualification of the site, which we expect to happen in this financial year, considering that Audits are now coming full swing. Right. And my last question, Arun, is that the when you say Vizag led business 58 crores, so bulk of this cost would be salary cost, right? Because if the plant is not operational, there is no utility. Salaries, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that we are getting ready the plant for any time inspection so that, you know, and HVAC maintenance, QC equipment maintenance, we have to be ready for uh, inspection. That's the initial cost which you have to incur, sir. Okay, great. So I have a few more questions. I'll come back in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. Participants would like to ask questions. Please press star, then one. The next question is from Rohit from Samadwa Investments. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so my first question is on uh, the regulated markets. I remember uh, in one of the previous calls, you had indicated that uh, the regulated markets you want to sell directly to the customers and not through channel partners. I just wanted to know how has the transition been? Have you been able to add any customers uh, in, in very general terms if you could just give some idea on that? Yeah. 
Hi, Rohit. This is uh, Jadesh here. Yes, uh, we have seen uh, recoveries in our business in Q4, where uh, our bulk of our business has been directly to the customers, and uh, our dependency on channel partners have considerably reduced. Uh, and related market perspective, uh, our, our, in traditionally, our business has always been uh, uh, direct. I would say 90% to 95% of our business has been direct. Great. Okay, sir. Uh, my second question would be on uh, the BASF facility in Germany. Uh, they had recently, you know, uh, released a press uh, press release stating that they may, you know, halt production in their German facility due to, you know, the gas prices shooting up. So, if you could just comment on that and, you know, how the uh, market in general for IBU uh, in the past one or two months in general. So we, we won't want to comment on the on the BSF uh, part, but uh, I can definitely talk about the demand for ibuprofen. Uh, so as we know, the last year has uh, has been not a good year for the ibu, but our demands have uh, started coming back from our existing customers as well as we are getting inquiries from new customers, which uh, we hope to convert them into uh, new business opportunities by supply of validation batches in this financial year. So as you can see, our revenue growth, uh, our revenue is coming back uh, to its historical levels. So, so our key products are uh, starting to do well. Great. Uh, so just one last question. Uh, on the CRAND division, uh, uh, prior to you know, when the merger was going to take place, I remember Aurora had a decent amount of CRAND's business within their portfolio. So now that the merger is not going through, uh, how do you plan to scale up this division? And right now it's a very small uh, percentage of the total revenues. How do you see that scaling up in the next maybe two to three years? So while France contributes about seven to eight percent of our total revenues, is still a major focus uh, for our uh, growth. Uh, we are adding in uh, new customers uh, as well as uh, we have uh, also developed some new technologies uh, which will give us uh, an advantage in terms of uh, securing new business. And as we speak, we are also building our CRAMS organization from a front-end perspective, where we would have a dedicated business development uh, uh, team member for, uh, uh, for looking after the North America market. So we do have one right now who focused on the Europe, and we are going to hire someone for the North America market. Great. So if I could just squeeze in one more question. Uh, in the last call, you had indicated that uh, even FY23, maybe second half, you will get back to your regular run rate of around 400 crores. Uh, for FY24 and 25, maybe, do you think that uh, we can do around 500 crores of quarterly revenues? So, uh, our focus right now, Rohit, is uh, you know to uh, strengthen the foundation of uh, Solara to get back to its historical run rate. And then uh, that we are seeing it from a revenue perspective. The next focus is in terms of how we improve our, uh, you know, uh, our EBITDA margins, our, our gross margins, which has been traditionally at about uh, uh, 50 to 54 percent. We see that coming back in second half of this year. Uh, and then the continuous improvement programs in terms of uh, you know, improving our EBITDA margin. So right now, this this is the focus for this year. And of course, once we strengthen the foundation and the, with WISAC facility getting, um, uh, we, we are hoping the WISAC facility being inspected, the Kudlu reclassification uh, from the FDA point of view, as well as the new products, uh, we have a target of filing at least six new products in this financial year, which can minimize the uh, impact on the R&D cost, uh, what we have, uh, uh, what we had last year. So yes, with uh, with all these growth prospects, we are uh, with all these uh, actions what we are taking, we are looking at building the business. I really would not be able to comment on the FI24, uh, but you can see that there are the growth pillars clearly being uh, actioned on. Uh, great, sir. Thank you so much, and uh, I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Tushar Manudhane from Motila Loswal Financial Services. Please go ahead. So sorry, it because your voice is not clear. May I request to use a handset, please? Is it better now? Uh, yes, we can hear you. 
Sir, on slide 11, there's a mention of uh, increase in net debt on account of increased inventory buildup planned for COVID-related business. Now, the outlook for COVID itself is reduced, at least uh, as, as we stand today. So, just would like to understand what happens to that inventory. Yeah, Hari here. See, the COVID-related products, two products we have inventory, and one of the products is, you know, getting sold in quarter one and quarter two of this current financial year. And, you know, other products also, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, plans for liquidation. There will not be any loss of uh, sale, loss of inventory uh, uh, in, in account of COVID products. We have a liquidation plan, and, you know, we have got a customer commitment for the sale. But the realizations would have reduced drastically, or we have reduced. You know, in the uh, we have in the quarter one and quarter two, it will get reduced, and by FI20 uh, next financial year, it will become more or less you know a reasonable level. I think, uh, Ari, the question is that will the price realization be lower? No, the price realization will not be lower. You know, we 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 have kept it at you know uh, that our price integration from the market is not that lower. It will be realized in a better price only. Okay. Uh, secondly, on the Vizac facilities, uh, so some amount of business was to get transferred from uh, Pondicherry to uh, Vizac, uh, uh, primarily on account of uh, better cost efficiencies at Vizac facility. So, so any yes. any color on that part? So that's the plan. You know that we are uh, build the capacity for ibuprofen in Vizac, and you know due to the regulatory delays due to the external reasons of COVID. You know, we could not, uh, you know, get this uh, in inspection. You know, once that Vizac uh, inspection takes place, I don't know, we'll be reallocating the capacity of, uh, you know, products from Pondicherry to Vizac. Got it. And just lastly on Aror, uh, while when it had a super normal uh, business performance, so that time itself it was very much evident that it is also due to COVID products. So, you know, just would like to understand, you know, what happened in between, or rather, even at that time, it was clear that the COVID products might, you know, kind of be through for maybe a couple of years or three years for a maximum. Uh, and still, we went ahead with uh, the merger. So, what... what yeah, so, uh, Ms. Arun, yeah, I can address that. Uh, so, the primary reason was that while the 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 tactical margins that, co that Aurora had at the, at the time of the merger was adjusted quite significantly in favor of the multiples for the Solara shareholders because we did do an adjustment on those profits. The key there was the non-COVID portfolio ramp up that Aurora will achieve uh, with a with non-COVID program. While they have filed a lot of dossiers, it's not translated into, into business as yet. It is, it is slowly picking up, but it would take a lot more time for it to achieve its numbers. And given the fact that, that that there would be a reset of the multiples of the numbers based on now, that was the primary reason. So they probably also, uh, Aurora has also been impacted by the fact that their new facility in Hyderabad has also not been inspected, which has also delayed quite significantly some of the uh, larger ramp up of the non-COVID products. So all in all, it didn't play out uh, as planned and as, as as late as September, even though the numbers were not uh, were not ramping up, we were still fully committed and invested into the process. Uh, but then it's been uh, not a great last six months uh, in terms of financial performance. So we think a road will take at least another year, year and a half for it to bounce back, and that would be a distraction for the core business at Solar. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Thank you. The next question is from Monish from Antic Stock Broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good good evening, everyone. Uh, so my first question is, uh, if our Vizac site uh, you know, was idle, uh, since it wasn't inspected by the FDA, uh, why didn't we use this opportunity to sell products in the non rack market? Hi, this is uh, Jitesh here. So, uh, as Hari had mentioned, the, one of the key product which we were looking at uh, transferring to Isaac was IBU. We had a lower demand in IBU overall for the last year. Uh, and that has uh, really impacted us because when 
uh, had this situation not happened, that was the plan in terms of uh, selling it uh, to markets where the, we had no regulatory binding. But overall, the IPO demand itself for the last year was uh, uh, was much much lower than we were, uh, which we even not had forecasted in our plans. Mm -hmm. So uh, any forecast that we had for ibuprofen demand for FY23 or uh, beyond? So we could have it contributed quarter. Yeah. So no. So yes, we do have plans, um, and uh, ibuprofen is just not one uh, API for us. We have multiple ibuprofen products within the umbrella of uh, the ibu business. Uh, so we are uh, uh, qualifying the other. Uh, uh, ibuprofens in the in the Vizac facility, and we are actively looking out for customers uh, to sell uh, uh, the com the quantities what we are going to be producing. The goal for Vizac in this financial year is again, uh, you know, to minimize the impact or the or the under recoveries what we have in Vizac, and we we do have some plans from second half of uh, this financial year. Uh, we are getting some commitments from customers uh, to buy from Vizac. Okay, but that will be pending the FDA clearance. So I'm talking about the markets where we don't have regulatory binding because even in the markets where we don't have regulatory binding, we still have to give some documentation in terms of at least a minimal documentation. And uh, once that is completed, the uh, uh, we will we start expecting sales from second half. Okay. And any non IBU products uh, which are going to be potential growth drivers that you would like to call out? Uh, yes, we we do have uh, the non IBU products where uh, the Solaris position is is pretty strong. Uh, we have products like gabapentin, Sevlamec carbonate, uh, Prasequental, and uh, you know we we are acquiring new customers because uh, in in some products uh, like the Sevlamec carbonate we were just focused uh, in the U.S. market uh, just based from the demand perspective, but we have tapped new markets also for Sevlamec carbonate. Where we are seeing some opportunities uh, uh, for new business to come in. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mitesh Shah from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, I just start with the macro level. What is the uh, uh, cost inflation right now in the raw material side, uh, our power cost and the freight cost? The, the raw material cost due to the current situation of the, uh, you know, the uh, between the international market conflict, you know, there is a, you know, the raw material price of really some of the key material has gone up nearly by 30 to 40 percent. We can say that, you know, even the solar prices, gas prices, and then the propylene prices, petroleum prices, all the solar have gone up by more than 40 percent. And even the uh, metal prices have gone up, chrome prices, chrome related to product. So there's an overall increase in the price of the gas-related product and you know the metal-related products we have seen, in affecting the input prices of our uh, raw material. So uh, do you expect that to cooling down in near term or it will remain the Yeah, once that you know the situation normalized in the international market, I think you know it's only temporary. Everybody's taken advantage of that and increase the prices. It will come to normal by second quarter. We hope so. And the freight charges are also in our elevated level. Pardon? Freight charges is also on our elevated level. We, we, our, our transportation is mainly by sea only, and you know that uh, it does it does not impact much. So that in you know, the last year level only, we can see the freight charges for that. Well, think, most uh, of the consumers are in uh, by sea freight only. And the, any chances or in the future we are looking for or for the major or this chapter is completely closed? No, so let me address that. Uh, at this time, uh, it is best to say that the chapter is closed um, and, and the company to focus on is organic reset and focus on its balance sheet. It's not that we'll shy away from doing transactions, but I think the focus for the next several quarters is to get the business back to where it used to be. And uh, that itself is a big task. So we can't, you can't be distracted away from the strategic goal. So that's where we are. 
And the my last question would be: You have given the 19.7% uh, EBITDA margin adjusting of the inventory changes and the YZEC. You explain about the YZEC, and I thought the inventory is adjustment done almost all the part on the Q3. So what is that uh, inventory adjustment in the Q4 right now? Uh, Hari here. In the Q4, the production level is uh, very very low, and whatever the inventory we had as of uh, end December got sold. So due to that, you know, there is a decrease in inventory and which is reflected in our financial. It's a, at this production level be normal, this inventory reduction will not be there. So that's what, you know, we are just highlighted properly that, you know, this inventory reduction, uh, opening stock got sold and much less production activity in during Q, Q4. Got it. So that would be expected to be normalized in 2H, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's the purpose we have highlighted, sir. Got it. And the, what is the ibuprofen price right now? So and at this point of time, it is anywhere at the average of eleven to twelve dollars a kilo. Thanks, thanks a lot, bro. That is for mine. Thank you. The next question is from Thomas Priju from Alchemy Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I had only one uh, specific question for uh, Arun. Uh, while the logic for calling off the Oro deal is uh, well taken. The only lingering concern is from a shareholder perspective, we will, would have ideally preferred a scenario where your interest is uh, in only one listed entity. Uh, so how does, you know, how should we view that, that uh, uh, you would still have a shareholder in the company which is separate and uh, that is we would, I, I ideally as a shareholder, one would prefer you to have all your ownership in one listed entity. You know, is there some way to address that dichotomy? There is a way, Thomas, and that is an easy way. I am in the process of exiting my interest in a road, consequent to this decision. It's a process of three to six months. And I am, I am very focused on governance and compliance, as you, you probably know me for too long to, to discuss this matter. Uh, the reason why we brought all the interests together was the two companies are doing well. Currently, both companies are not, and it, we are we are very very confident of strongly rebuilding Solara to where it should be. We are very significant stakeholders in Solara, Solara and we intend to do that, including we uh, to be more invested. Uh, so our interest in the next six months will be fully committed and aligned only in Solara. Thanks a lot, Arun, for the clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Bhaskar Bukhrediwala from RK Investments. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for, for uh, taking the question. Uh, the question was on this R&D-led growth business. So where you're sort of showing the EBITDA at 54 crore. The question is, uh, so this is all research and development expense for new products, right? Because, uh, and the whole research expense is getting... Uh, uh, nothing is getting capitalized. Everything is basically passed through the PNS. Is correct. that right? Yeah, Hari. Yeah, correct. Sir. Nothing is being capitalized. Everything is routed through routed through the PNS. Okay. So, I mean, this 54 crore is what is routed through PNL, and beyond this, there is no single uh, rupee that is getting in the balance sheet. No, no, nothing is getting into balance We all normally our accounting policy is always a, a routed through PNL only. That's a consistently being followed, and you know we are not held back any uh, intangible assets in financial books pertaining to the new product development. Okay, and going forward, so uh, given this is the expenditure for developing new products, uh, going forward from a uh, annual run rate perspective. Um, and specifically for FY23 and 24, uh, what would be the expenditure on new products? Would the same run rate of 54, 55 crore continue, or there is um, there could be a revisit to this? We are rationalizing the spend, and uh, judicially we you know we don't expect more than this, but we are working on how it can be optimized. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, one question on your uh, non ibu business. So, uh, if you can help understand both this quarter and otherwise, how has been your non ibu business on existing products scaling up? And I'm assuming that once new filings, 
uh, happen uh, next year that will further help to drive the non IGU sales. So, uh, if you could give some sense on the existing products which are already approved, which you are selling, and some of the products which you would have got, which are currently small, how are they sort of shaping up in terms of uh, the growth? Yeah, hi, this is Jitesh here. Uh, so, on the non IBU business, uh, there too, for our key products, um, uh, we are seeing uh, the recovery coming back. Uh, the last year has also been a little dull for, uh, uh, you know, products like uh, saltamavir, succinyl, coal, and chloride. And uh, now, as we step into this financial year, when we looked at um, uh, our numbers, uh, we are seeing a, a demand uh, coming back for the non IBU business, uh, especially led by. Uh, GABA pentene and uh, uh, Cephalomac carbonate, uh, Trazequental. So, what we have done, the actions what we have taken in the last uh, uh, three to four years, uh, all these products where we have a good uh, position from a cost point of view, we've also done market extensions uh, for these products. And those market extensions are now uh, fructifying in terms of uh, the approvals coming in and the uh, new demands uh, coming in from uh, new customers as well as from new regions. Okay. Would you be able to give some guidance in terms of next two, three years? How do you see this non IV business uh, going? So we don't give a revenue split between the IBU and the non-IBU, but I can assure you that uh, the non-IBU business uh, will continue to grow. And in the non-IBU business, we don't uh, uh, consider the new products. So as uh, Arun had alluded earlier, uh, the new products uh, uh, usually cover the cost of uh, the R&D expenses what we spend because we do validation batches and those validation batches are sold to the customers for filing purposes. So the, the new products, like for example, the six new products we have plans in terms of filing for this financial year would give us some revenues in this year as well as in the next financial year. So it's more like a rolling uh, as we keep doing uh, uh, or introduce new products. Okay, okay, got it. And one just last question. Uh, so uh, the API prices in general, I mean, apart from IBU demand related issues has been a bit weak. Uh, so as the as uh, and uh, we've seen the same in U.S. generic formulation market. So as uh, the U.S. generic market starts to see some pricing pressure uh, being reduced, uh, do we see the same sort of translating into uh, better API pricing uh, in terms of our ability to then pass on uh, or uh, get better realizations from the formulation players? So in the past, uh, you know, we, we had similar situations where, you know, the raw material price had increased and uh, we had to wait and watch uh, because you just can't pass on the price increase even for a formulation player. It, it's not, it, it, it does not happen immediately. We just have to wait because is it temporary or is it going to be a, 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 a six months or a one year? So when we assess the situation and we know that the raw material price is not uh, uh, it's not temporary. Then we do discuss with our customers, and then we either pass on or we take at least we pass on 50% of the cost, and then they bear 50% of the cost. More or less, uh, the, the pricing has been stable, especially except for IBU, where uh, uh, there has been a, a reduction in the uh, the price, and uh, we are working on uh, the continuous improvement program for all our products. Uh, and that's been one of our adding contributor to the EBITDA margins in the previous financial years. Got it. Got it. And just small last question, if I can squeeze in. Uh, what is the CAPEX program now uh, that your balance sheet has got uh, some bit of debt and there's a lot of realignment? Any uh, rethink on the organic CAPEX plans for next two years? What sort of guidance would you like to give there? In the FY23, we are to uh, incur nearly 100 crores uh, uh, organic capex to support the ongoing investments in WISAC and other uh, in maintenance capex. It will be around 100 crores with the capital expenditure for uh, FY23. Okay. And that means this includes maintenance capex as well. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Sure. sure. Thanks so much. That's all from us. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we did the last two questions.
We take the question from the line of Shikha Mehta from Equity Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, I just have a follow-up question to one of the participants. I think uh, you mentioned that the revenue from new products was zero, um, and in our presentation, it says it was five percent on slide thirty-one. So, if you could just clarify that. Yeah. So, just to clarify. Uh, so we can't break up business into too many buckets, but the new products, when we say 5%, these are the new products which were developed uh, earlier and, uh, you know, had a, a, a commercial launch uh, in the previous financial year. So uh, that's the revenue which we are talking about is from the 5%. So we have an internal policy where we, uh, class we declassify a new product uh, post two years of uh, uh, commercial uh, revenue. Okay. All right, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We take the last question from the line of Manish Gupta from Solidarity. Please go ahead. Yeah. So uh, this is a question for Arun. Uh, rather, there are two questions, Arun. Arun, if you can, uh, you know, last year uh, when the merger with Aurora was announced, there was a very uh, explicit vision laid out that we needed to be a billion dollar company which needed to have uh, new products. There was a $250 million or so bridge that would come from acquisitions. You know, now that uh, things seem to have completely turned on its head, how, uh, you know, we're all minority shareholders, but you're at the wheel. So can you help us understand what now in your book, based on uh, your vantage point, what would be how how would you define success for Solara over the next let's say over the next five years? Great, yeah, great question. So you know we we are as capital operators and entrepreneurs in this business for too many years focused on building scale. Uh, nothing in that in that book changes in terms of our vision to become an important global player. And uh, nothing is going to stop us from doing this. We are facing, not only us, the industry is facing uh, temporary headwinds. Uh, initially, there was an exuberance around COVID for stocking, which uh, finally resulted to irrational exuberance of overstocking. That resulted in uh, kind of companies restocking and getting off of inventory, resulting in this roller coaster ride that most of the industry has gone through. That's the business environment that we operate. Uh, is that going to change our, our views on building this business to scale? The answer is no. Uh, with, can we do this organically? The answer is also not, uh, is not yes. Uh, we have to have an inorganic element to this business. Uh, but we need to steady the ship. Uh, the, the headwinds of ibuprofen, in our view, is temporary. It's a critical product. We have been uh, in the market for 30 years. Uh, we have sold only 40% of our annual demand last year, we see business bouncing back. Uh, our focus now is to ensure that we do not have under recoveries in Vizac, uh, bring our debt to EBITDA to a reasonable level, and we will continue to pursue opportunities which are inorganic in nature. But I don't think uh, the vision has moved, maybe the timing has shifted, and that would be the same answer you would receive from any other entrepreneur in the space who's got, who has face these challenges. These are not unique to us. Of course, we had very significant uh, uh, sort of mini missteps in the, um, in the last several quarters. But I think we now have got our act together back. We've got the team uh, that we, uh, the team that built this business or what we call is the dream team back to run, run the business. We have a board which is very supportive. Uh, and, and I'm very, very confident that we will still emerge amongst the top 10 global players. We probably will take two more years, but um, that is to do with the circumstances in the business environment that we operate in. And the second part of my question, that let's take a five-year view. Uh, what would be, what, how, how would you define success? What should Solara have reached in about five years from now? Well, I think, you know, success can be measured in so many, many ways. I, I will not put a revenue number to it. I think that to be a preferred uh, API supplier, to be a high quality player, uh, to have regulated markets as its primary focus, having more portfolio into to define, to have different level, different chemistry capabilities, 
getting into new areas, building a crams business of scale. If, if we don't achieve all of this, we would have failed in many subsects of this definition of success. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Abhishek Singhal for closing comments. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You all have a good day. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Solara Active Pharma Sciences Limited, that concludes this conference. We thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.